Hi, everyone. I hope this hot summer month of July 2021 is treating you well. Yes, so far so good for me. This week, we are going back to the beginning of season two to one of our favorite conversations that we've had with Lisa Unger. Um, we have here her latest book. Christy and I both have them here. I have two copies. I actually have three copies in my house. It's called Woo-hoo! Confessions on the 745. And I have my own copy. And Lisa was kind enough to send us each a copy and one for a giveaway. But since I already have one, I'm, we're going to be able to give away two, Christy. Two, two. two, two. So July book yeah. giveaway is two lucky winners. Yeah, it's going to be great. Yes. And um, anyway, so this is a, this is such a good book. And you know, yeah. Kathy, it was also nominated for the Strand Magazine's Critics Award for Best Mystery of 2021. I just saw that recently on her um, social media. And if you don't follow Lisa's social media, you really should. She's She's always um, interviewing, always talking to other writers and shares it on her Facebook page. Um, during mm-hmm. the pandemic, I don't know if she's still doing it. She um, was doing a chat conversation with other authors called Three Good Things. It was just this really positive, upbeat. I know, uh, she, she was theory. great when we talked yeah. to her, you know, it was like the same thing. And she just had such, I don't know, she's just, she's a smart woman, I feel. She is, and she's really genuine and giving. Yeah. I mean, she's a fantastic author, but a fantastic human as well. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So also another accolade for Confessions on the 745. If you're watching this on YouTube, look at that great cover. Isn't that creepy? I know. <laughs> so good. Matches the book. But this was just chosen as, um, I, I mean, not just, maybe a few months ago, um, as one of book lists, top 10 um, crime fiction of the year. So yeah. that's not too shabby. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. So this book is all the rage and you're going to want to go out and get a copy. So we'll put a link on our website where you can just order it now that it's in paperback too. Yeah. Well, I um, we hope you enjoy this redux of our Quirks and Conversation with Lisa Unger. Welcome to the Game of Books podcast, Quirks and Conversation. We are so excited to be talking with best-selling author, Lisa Unger. She is a New York Times and internationally best-selling author of 17 novels with millions of readers worldwide and novels published in 26 languages. Lisa Unger is widely regarded as a master of suspense. In 2019, she received two Edgar Award nominations, an honor held by only a few writers, including Ruth Rendell and Agatha Christie. Unger's critically acclaimed books have been voted best of the year or top picks by the Today Show, Good Morning America, Entertainment Weekly, Amazon, IndieBound, and many others. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, and Travel and Leisure. And she lives on the west coast of Florida with her family, which is not too far from me. Lisa, we're so happy you're available to talk with us today. Oh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. Absolutely. Um, Before we get started with our conversation, though, Kathy, why don't you tell everyone what wine we're drinking today? Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, We are going to each enjoy a glass of Louis M. Martini Cabernet Sauvignon from Sonoma County. I'm going to have a sip Um, now. I'll read you the description. (laughs) Okay. Yes, I think we all should. Yes. Yes. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That is the point of enjoying this together. <laughs> oh, it is. That's yummy. It okay. is good. So this is, um, it's got a really interesting uh, description. Um, and I, I did mention that it's from Sonoma County for a reason. Um, according to the um, website for Louis M. Martini, um, this Cabernet reflects the best of the warm, narrow, dry creek valley and the hot yet wind-cooled Alexander Valley. Nice. Together, these unique features, yeah. (laughs) So apparently that's very specific to this area. Um, And together, these unique features create a balanced Cabernet Sauvignon with concentrated notes of, are you ready? Mm -hmm. Dark fruit, black tea, and cocoa. Oh. The full, yeah. So the cocoa is interesting. And it's supposed to lead to a supple, and persistent finish, which I don't really know what that means. But anyway, let's enjoy and see what we think. Well, I think it's really good. 
I, I think this this is tasty. And Lisa, you chose the wine, so um, I did. Do, do you have any interesting stories surrounding this choice, or can you? I don't. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't have I just like interesting it. to say about it at all. Oh, Except no. that you know, I mean, I don't really know that much about wine. I'm not, you know, I've only recently like started to enjoy it, mm-hmm. and I um, but I really find that the you know the Cabernet Sauvignon to be like kind of my favorite because it's very big. You mm-hmm. know, it doesn't. It's like it's fruity and like kind of round and like just bold in in a way that other wines aren't. So Mm -hmm. I I have a couple of favorites. There's this one. And then also I like a, a Camus and also a Clos Pagas. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's just kind of, I mean, I, you know, as a wine drinker, it's purely about, you know, what tastes good to me. Right. Right. (laughs) In that moment. And for us, it's also, this is good because this is under $20, which is what we kind of try to, you know, do. So it's a great wine to have on hand and everything. Yeah. And with those other very expensive wines, like I don't, I don't think that they're, you know, I think that this really holds its own with those, with those other more expensive wines. Yeah. I I think it's I think it really is good. Yeah. Well, good choice. Thank you, Lisa. (laughs) I'm glad. Thank you. Okay, so now that we have our wine in hand, I'm going to ease into some questions. Um, Okay. So you, um, actually, one question that that came up on our um, last week's podcast, we were wondering, since you're this international bestseller and your book is in a lot of different languages, books are in a lot of different languages, do you have copies of Mm -hmm. all those books in all those different languages? I I do. I I do have. I mean, you definitely get, (laughs) you definitely get, you know, um, five or 10 copies from, for every foreign edition. Oh, cool. And, and not just, you know, not just that we also get, you know, five or 10 copies of, you know, the audio used to get that. I mean, I'm not sure how much longer that would be where you get the box of CDs, like a lot of it's digital now, but yeah, you get the audio book, the large print edition, you know, all that. So there's always (laughs) a, you know, there's always a big influx of books and the foreign editions are, you always see the cover early, you know, because they send it to you much in the way your U.S. publisher will, Mm -hmm. you know, send your cover, your cover proof for approval and stuff. So you always kind of know, but it's always very, exciting to see the the foreign edition of of every book not every book is you know has the same foreign you know the same foreign publisher so every there's a lot of different visions for oh, each cover treatment oh that's yeah. fun i'd love to see your library shelves that just sounds I know, right? so fun to have all yeah. this different <laughs> <laughs> Um, so also over the years, you've um, given some really solid advice to aspiring authors like Kathy and me and many of our listeners. One of the things that stood out, which was the biggest first step, meaning you have to actually finish your novel. Yeah. <laughs> and we've, we know you've finished um, and published at least 17 novels. So it appears you have that down. And so we're kind of curious, do you have... <laughs> like a strict writing schedule, like a time of day or so many words or hours, or can you just tell us a little bit about your process in getting that novel written? Yeah, absolutely. I am. So I, you know, my golden creative hours are from 5 a.m. to noon. Mm -hmm. But that is the time of day when I am at my most creative. And the earlier I can be at my desk, the better, you know, before the earlier you can get at your desk before, you know, everybody else is awake and before your internal editor gets up and your external editor, for that matter, <laughs> and uh, and your mother, hopefully, you know, like you can, the, mo- the earlier you can get to the desk and be as close as possible, at least for me, to that dream brain, mm-hmm. the better. So my ideal writing day is, you know, I get a creative cycle in um between like five and seven and that's usually when my daughter gets up and I get her ready for school and all of that stuff and then um I'm back to my desk by 8 15 and then that next block that 8 15 to 12 15 block that's you know very it's very important it's very important to the process to have those four like sort of uninterrupted hours and then you know I'll probably break in you know around that time and eat and exercise and then try to get one more creative cycle in before my daughter gets home from school. 
Um, and then once, you know, she's done, then it's kind of like game on, mom time, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like running around, activities, homework, dinner, all that stuff. So that's kind of the ideal day. And then like sort of the shallow work of social media and, you know, the business stuff and all that. Like I try to keep that for the time when she's doing her homework because, mm-hmm. you know, once she's home and once I'm in that other brain, creativity comes less easily to me in that later part of the day. Oh, that's, that's um, interesting. Which is yeah. something that's very specific to me. Like a lot of people feel that their creativity comes at the end of the day, you mm-hmm. know, when everything's done. And then that's when they can be, that's when they can close it all off and do what they need to do. But that that's really what works best for me. Right. And and I think both Kathy and I are morning people like that, too. And I like how yeah. you called it the dream brain, because that's so true. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. you wake up and you've got this thought in your head. And, you know, if right. you don't get it down on paper, then it's gone, you know. <laughs> exactly. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very, I mean, in my process is like very, it's very subconscious. Like I write without an outline. You don't know who's going to show up day to day or what they're (laughs) going to do. So I really have to be in that headspace. Like I have to be very present for that kind of storytelling mind. Right. And, um, And the earlier in the day, the better. Well, that kind of leads to the other question that I had for you, which was, um, we talked about last week also that developing characters and, you know, you you write such richly developed characters. And so, yeah. yeah, we were wondering, you know, now you're saying that maybe you don't, but we thought, well, maybe you write a detailed history and physical description of the character before you even start writing or... No, no, nothing like that. So the so I, a long time ago, I started thinking, I stopped thinking of characters as people that I create and started thinking of them as people that I meet. And oh. even though that's, of course, not the truth of it, that is how I experience it. Mm-hmm. So I get to know my characters on the page much in the same way that my readers will later get to know them was sort of layer by layer. Interesting. And I've sort of, you know, everything, everything, everything about the book flows from those characters. All plot flows from those characters. So Mm -hmm. for me, like there could be like a moment, you know, there's a, there's always a germ, right. For the story. It might be something that I read. It might be a new story. It might be a line of poetry. So it could be anything really, And then whatever that is, in the case of The Stranger Inside, for me, it was something that I read a long time ago while researching another novel. I read a book called The Inner World of Trauma by Dr. Daniel Kalshad. And in that, he talked about, um, in the case, he talked about mental illness in a way that I had not heard before. Mm -hmm. Um, So in the case of extreme child childhood trauma uh the psyche can split it's not like split personality disorder in the way that we know it like in fiction Mm -hmm. but it's um where the stronger aspects of the personality emerge to protect to protect the weaker aspects of the personality Mm -hmm. and the way he wrote about it the way he talked about it it was almost like you know um it was almost like as if it were a gift like that is how the self survives extreme mm-hmm. trauma. Well, that was that was and, so interesting how you did it in the book too. I, that was right. So so that was the so that was the germ, and that idea kicks around for a long time, like any of them do. Like the kind of, and then will lead me to like a lot of research. I'll start doing all this research about a topic that ob- obsesses me, which in this case is the um, you know it was the it's a it's a Jungian term called the splinter psyche. Okay. And so that kind of obsesses me, and I, I, I try to learn as much about it as I can. And then while I'm in that process, like, the best way I can describe it is if it connects with something greater that's going on within me, then I start to hear a voice or voices. Mm-hmm. So it might be one voice. It might be multiple voices. And then I follow those voices through the manuscript. That's, and I've written that's every cool. single book this way. Yeah. It's sort, it's yeah. sort of like that split personality thing that you're talking about. Yeah. It is a little bit. Yeah. Like, it is a little bit. You know, because I really I do just thinking sometimes that. feel like, like Ooh. the person who sits down to write is not the same person who gets up and, you know, 
packs a lunch for right. my daughter and takes her to school and is sitting on a car line later. Like, in a lot of ways, I feel like it's not it's not the same brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know that, and 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 truly, I've always mm-hmm. been this way. Like, I've never, I don't remember a time in my life before I considered myself a writer. Interesting. So I've always been doing this. In one way or another. And so well, then, we're happy for that. So then, <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. <laughs> so once you get your germ and you do your research and then you just start when I, when the characters are talking to you, it, so you must write it then in a linear fashion, like from beginning I to do. end because you don't know? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't either. either. What's going to happen? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not even 100% sure what the book is about. Mm-hmm. while I'm writing and I definitely don't know how it's going to end. I'm sure there are easier right. ways to do, I'm sure there are easier ways to do this. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I don't, my, my linear brain can't take this. <laughs> yeah. My, I just so thinking, at some point don't though, you part, have outlines do you... So you have to look at? <laughs> yeah. Some people do. I mean, and you, I think you will find probably you've talked to a lot of writers mm-hmm. that you'll find that people do fall into two distinct camps and both camps are, you know, very, you find plenty of people with, who are doing it with great success either way, but there are those meticulous outliners. And, That's you know, Kathy. They, they have, a, you know, a clear, <laughs> <laughs> they have a clear idea of how the book is going to go. They have full character sketches. Mm-hmm. They have, um, you know, they have everything um, that, you know, is going to be in the book. They're They're aware of it you know, before they sit down to start mm-hmm. write, you know, writing the book. And then there are people that write the way I do. Yeah. So basically uh-huh. there's no right or wrong. It's whatever works for you. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Just yeah. fi- just finishing it, as you say. Just finish it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you finish, finish the, the book, then it worked for you. Yeah. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay. All right. So, Lisa, we have a little transition here. This is the time we like to ask our authors what we call the question in the bottle. Um, just kind of random questions that might come up if you got towards the bottom of an actual wine bottle. Um, oh, we'll, we'll pick a random question. <laughs> and if you don't like it, you can pass and we'll try another. So, Christy, okay. what do we have? Okay. So, this question is, would you rather live for a week in the past or the future? The future. Oh. Well, that was great. Really? Yeah, that, you didn't even think about that one. That was a gut reaction. No. <laughs> Do you know how far in the future? <laughs> as far as possible. <laughs> right? Obviously. I'm so curious about how um, we're going to evolve or if we're going to evolve as a species. Right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm really curious about that. Oh. Like, yeah. really. Yeah. I know. There's- I know. Legitimate it's scary questions. though. It's just a little <laughs> scary, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so I've got a couple questions for you. So on your website, on lisaunger.com, by the way, mm. um, yeah. you have a notes tab where you have written conversations with other authors like Mary oh, Kubica yeah. and Tess Gerritsen. And I love reading these and I I'm oh, sure so you're you're I love it, and I'm sure your other fans do too. And so I was wondering how this came about. It's such a great read. Um, you know how it came about. This is like such an interesting thing. I so I have my, one of my good writer pals is a Los Angeles based thriller writer, New York Times bestseller Greg Hurwitz, and we've been friends forever. And we got asked by uh, I'm trying to remember what the publication was. It might have been Booklist, or yeah, it might have been Booklist. And they wanted us to, they wanted us to argue about <laughs> a point. Like, uh, I do it this way, you do it that way. They wanted us to argue in writing oh. about a certain thing. And we literally could, we sincerely could not find one thing that we disagreed <laughs> about. <laughs> so that was a fail. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in process or personal or anything. <laughs> So we were like, can we just interview each other? Can we just have a, you know, can we just have a chat? And they were like, yeah, okay, fine. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> so we just, so I started doing that, and I just loved doing it with him because it was such a, you know, it was such a nice way for us to kind of hang out. We, you know, we live in different parts of the country. We only see each other once a year or twice a year of that. So it was kind of a nice thing to do. And so I just kind of thought, wow, how nice is this? 
I wonder if other people would want to do it with me. And so every once in a while, you know, I, I ask somebody to do, I call it my pen pal series. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically I write, you know, I write something and then end with a question and then the other, um, my other, you know, the other author will, um, you know, answer the question and then end with a question and we kind of go back and forth a few times and uh, it always it's always different. It always want, turns into like such an interesting conversation. I feel like it could just kind of go on and on. I usually kind of, you know, check it after four or five, <laughs> you know, back and forth because they're long. You know, they're pretty long. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they are. But it's just been such a nice way to connect with people and get to know them. I I just find it fascinating. Yeah, just I'm just the thought occurred to me. You should really compile them into a a book. <laughs> oh yeah, that's a great separate, idea. Just as a separate. Uh, she you know, gets, little Kathy project. wants a commission. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sure. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it was your idea. <laughs> no, no, no. But I just love reading them. So I'm guessing that one of the perks then for you, or upsides of this writing world, is your relationships with other writers. I'm just guessing because, oh, yeah. in addition to what you just said. Christy and I got to see you at Thriller Fest being interviewed by Karen Slaughter. Oh, <laughs> oh are you I, there? Oh my God! Yes, yes, I was the I was the timer. Were... I was the timer that didn't know what she was doing. <laughs> <I know. laughs> but my favorite thing was that Karen shows up with was it a unicorn head headband or something. Yeah, it was, it was unicorn, unicorn horns. We wore them the entire time. Yeah, I actually forgot yeah. we were wearing them. Even though I was looking at her and she was wearing it, I just sort of became normal after a while. It was great. It was great. That was awesome. Yeah, Karen, Karen I and thought... I have been uh, we've been friends for a really long time, and um, you know she she's just like one of my you know she's one of my besties, and uh, and that really is the case. I mean, I've been being for you know I've been writing for. I guess 17 years now I've been published for 17 years and uh prior to that I, I also worked in book publishing so I I kind of you know it, it's definitely like my home industry so mm -hmm. over the years you know those relationships evolve like any other relationship that you have you know you become friends with your colleagues in any in you know in any industry I'm sure mm -hmm. and so that's you know, kind of how it's been for me. And I think, you know, specifically like the, you know, the thriller and mystery community is just such a nice community. I mean, we're very sort of genuinely kind of into each other and supportive of each other. And, you know, we, we do a lot to, to help each other and, you know, and spread the word about um, other people's books and stuff. And we're, you know, and that's a true like sort of organic thing. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. a gen, there's a genuine affection there. So uh, I really love that about our community, and it's definitely I've really noticed know, it too. To I'm Kathy fun. and I have because you know, I mean, we met yeah. at a conference, but then you know, all this we, whenever we interview somebody or we just meet somebody at a conference, they're everybody's so giving. You know, it's really nice. yeah, yeah. And I I wondered if it was like like you say it is. I mean, it's a a really nice warm community and I wondered if it had something to do with the fact that it you know we're, we're all doing a solitary task and yeah. then when you get together you know, I don't mm -hmm. know yeah but I hear other writing communities are not as warm <laughs> oh really <laughs> really <laughs> I mean, there's, it's something specific to the mystery thriller community because I hear like a lot of people who you know who come into the community from other areas are like, I can't believe how nice you guys are to each other. Oh, <laughs> it's because we're killing all our demons out by killing people. Yeah, we're killing yeah, people all the time on paper. We're exercising all our demons onto the page. Yes, so we don't exactly. have any. We right. don't have anything left. <laughs> yeah, so only true. good things left for your friends. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's mm. awesome. Okay, so I've also, I did my research, and I have run across you saying in a couple different interviews that you uh -huh. live for the blank page. Oh, I do. And I <laughs> thought that was such a beautifully optimistic view of writing that you don't yeah. hear very often. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, I do. I do live for the blank page. I mean, I, I have to say, it's the most exciting thing. It's a portal. Mm -hmm. It's a portal to everything. You know, when the page is blank... And, and you're present for, you know, what can be, 
then there's a, yeah. just a tremendous joy and excitement that I experience. You know, in fact, mm-hmm. I, I teach a class on creativity, and I've done it mm. a couple times with, with kids. You know, I've gone into my daughter's yeah. school and I've gone into a couple other schools. Oh, neat. And the only thing I bring for this class is a piece of paper and a pencil. Mm-hmm. And I give everybody one of these things, and I tell them that this is everything. Every painting, mm. every drawing, every line of poetry, every song, every film script, every novel, every single thing, every scientific theorem, every idea, everything can be accomplished with these two things. Oh, man, you're giving oh, me goosebumps amazing. over here. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> and, and no. you know, and, and, I, and I asked them, I said, the next time, you know, we, we talked about this whole class about things that keep us from being creative and all of that. At the end, I tell them, the next time you're bored and you have been taught to fear your boredom, so the minute you're bored, you pick up a device and you disappear into that, into that device. Mm-hmm. The next time you're bored, pick up a pencil and a piece of paper and do whatever it is that you want to do with it. Yeah. And wow, that's such, that is good time. advice. Yeah. No, <laughs> this is what so- I ask. Yep. It's like the antidote to our concerns about screen time and our devices. That's that yeah. is, and I that is really it is such an optimistic, lovely way to look at things, as opposed to the whole you know the blank page. You know, you rip open your veins and bleed on the paper. You know, it's just such a. Yeah, such I know. A I don't get that at all. It. Like when people say that, I'm, I'm, I just want to laugh. I'm like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and then I wonder why are you spending your time doing it if that's right. how you feel about it? Like that's. I know exactly. Horrible. I just think what a what a blessing. You mm-hmm. know. Yeah. What a, jo- what a joy to be able to create a world. Mm-hmm. You know, like what a you know what a wonderful thing. I mean, I I never wanted to do anything else. I never wanted to be anything else. So I feel a tremendous amount of gratitude that I am able you know, to make my living doing what I to, love. I mean, that's huge. It is amazing. It's an amazing gift. And we had talked to Hank Philippi Ryan a few weeks ago, and she said the Another same thing. How besties. thankful. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's lovely. She's wonderful right? too. And, yeah. And uh, you know, she thought the, said the same thing about what a lovely um, gift it is to be able to be to be doing what she's doing. And I just thought, oh, yeah. I love that. That just mm-hmm. that's I'm drawn to that, right? Instead of the whole blood. Oh, although we do <laughs> yeah. all handle blood plenty, but you know. Um, yeah, I mean, okay, it's, so yeah, it's is, like you know, yeah. it's. It's like anything else that you do that you care about, you know, it's it, obviously the act of, you know, it's hard, it's hard to get published. Mm-hmm. It's hard, you know, the act of writing a novel is, you know, it's a relationship, it's a commitment, you know, mm-hmm. um, the, you know, it's, it's difficult to get published. It's even harder to succeed once you are published. There's tremendous, you know, there's tremendous competition, you know, there are dizzying highs and, crushing lows in the writing life for sure but Mm -hmm. beneath it all it's it's just a gift to be able to do it Mm -hmm. it's just a blessing well lisa that's why we wanted to talk to you today we're (laughs) so happy to have had this opportunity so great to talk to you guys before we go we have a final question that we like to um ask it it appeases our mysterious foodies that's what we call our listeners out there um, okay. so mm-hmm. which of your characters would you like to share a meal with and what would it be? Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess if it was going to be anybody, it would be Eloise Montgomery. She's a recurring character in a number of my books that she first turned up in Fragile mm-hmm. and she's a psychic. Ooh. <laughs> when she, yeah. When she first turned up. I was like, oh, great, a psychic, you know. <laughs> even if, <laughs> even if Thanks for visiting. Fraud, you know, that's still <laughs> interesting. Mm-hmm. You know, like I still want to get to know her better. Mm-hmm. And then in Fragile, she had like a little tiny role to play. It was a pivotal role, but it, she didn't have a lot of time on the page. And so I wound up writing another book about her, um, Darkness, My Old Friend. And then I also wrote a novella um, about her, which spans like 30 years of her life. And she came to being a psychic leader in life after a horrible accident, a terrible mm-hmm. tragedy. And since then, she's had quite a journey. And I'm not going to spoil any of it, but let's just say she's she's reached another evolution. And I mm-hmm. I would be very interested to find out what she knows now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
after she has gone on to this next level. And I get, I, what would we eat? I don't know. I guess we would just have a yeah. pizza. A pizza? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> it's easy. Pizza's <laughs> easy. It's we'd easy. So much to, we'd have so much to talk about. Right. I don't know. Right. Where, yeah. You, you just want, want you don't want to have to think <laughs> about it, you know? Yeah. Just. <laughs> <laughs> that's not that's a very awesome. good foodie answer if you want me to think about it more i'm sure I come up with no 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 exciting. no it's good we like pizza there's nothing too. better than pizza <laughs> right <laughs> that's what i think okay. i mean you can make it Ugh. really good mm-hmm. yeah okay so lisa if our listeners have any more questions or want more information about you and your books what's the best way for them to reach out well you know you I'm easy to find. You know, you can find me on, on social media. I am interactive in real time on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram primarily. There's a FAQ on my website, so pretty much anything you want to know about me can be can be found there at lisaunger.com. And, um, awesome. Yeah. And then if you are interested in experiencing the work without committing any money to it, if you sign up for my newsletter, you will <laughs> automatically get a free short story. Oh, nice. Oh. So. That's great. There yeah. you go. <laughs> We're going to sign up, too. Go to lisaunger.com. <laughs> yes, we are. Okay. Yep. And you can sign up for the newsletter there quite easily, and you will get um, a PDF of a short story, or if you are, you know, if you don't want to read electronically, I will send the story to you. Very nice. Wow. That's awesome. Well, yeah. thank you again, internationally well, best selling author. Fun. Oh, good. We're glad you enjoyed it. We have a lot of fun with it. <laughs> and if you haven't read her latest book, um, The Stranger Inside, go out and get it. It's a great read. And you can listen to our last episode for book club ideas to go along with it. So <laughs> have fun with that. Guess what? It's time to say cheers. 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 cheers.